Hello, welcome to the Wednesday, February 5th, 2020 edition of the Sands and Storm Center's Stormcast. My name is Johannes Ulrich, and today I'm recording from Jacksonville, Florida. So today was the day and Google did release Google Chrome 80 with this Google fixed a good number of security vulnerabilities and as sort of announced uh, before the release, the same site cookie feature will actually be delayed and not turned on until two weeks from today. And at this point, it will only be turned on for a small fraction of Google Chrome users. So uh, Google is playing a little bit with a stage rollout for this feature. Another sort of change in security feature that's coming with a Google Chrome 80 is that if you have mixed content on HTTPS website, so the website itself is HTTPS, but it's loading, for example, audio files, video files via HTTP, Google Chrome will try to automatically upgrade that content to HTTPS. Also remember that with the last uh, Microsoft update mid-January, we did get uh, Microsoft Edge based on Google Chrome. So all of these changes will also apply if you're running the most recent version of Edge. In general, upgrades are pretty straightforward and automatic with Google Chrome. So really not much you have to do at this point. Now talking about Google Chrome, there is a pretty popular platform that uh, I've mentioned a couple times when it came to security vulnerability called Electron. Electron is a platform based on in part Chromium, the open source part of Chrome, and it allows developers to create desktop applications that at their core use essentially HTML and JavaScript. So this makes it easy to turn a web application into a desktop application. Slack is probably the biggest example of an application written using Electron, but there are a number of other high profile applications like for example, WhatsApp. Now, security researcher Gal Weitzman took a closer look at a WhatsApp and actually first at the web application that you can use uh, to interact with WhatsApp. And he found a number of vulnerabilities, including cross-site scripting. Cross-site scripting, I always call it one of the most underestimated vulnerabilities. And that's definitely true here because the desktop application using the same technologies, think about it as sort of a mini browser really that the application is running in is now also vulnerable to cross-site scripting, but it doesn't provide some of the protections that you have in place. If you're, for example, loading JavaScript into a browser from a website. So the end effect is that with WhatsApp, once you exploit that cross-site scripting vulnerability against the desktop application, you are actually able to read arbitrary files from the users system. Now, one of his takeaways here also that yes, if you're using Electron, you have to keep the Chromium part up to date. If you're today updating Chromium to 80, then well, you're not updating the Chromium component that's included in these Electron applications, because as far as your operating system is concerned, this is really just sort of a normal desktop application. And the developer has to provide updates for it that also so update components like Chromium. Of course, ever since the Mirai bot came around, uh, we have seen that uh, many of uh, these uh, simple IP cameras are no longer having a Telnet server listening, which is probably a very wise decision. But apparently some of them still allow the user to start one and also start one remotely. Interesting vulnerability here based on this idea in high silicon based DVRs. Now, high silicon is a basic DVR board that's used in many of these devices under various brands. And the way they work is that they have a TCP port 9530 listening and they're waiting for an incoming connection. Now, when someone connects, they're responding with a random eight digit number. And then the client uses a 
breach shared key to then essentially sort of respond to this challenge. Overall, this wouldn't be terrible if they wouldn't use the same default key in all of their devices, which of course then results in anybody being able to connect on port 9530. And while this is not sort of a standard protocol, you only need to essentially send a command to start a Telnet daemon and the debug port 9527, which is another port that could be used for code execution. And of course, once the Telnet daemon is running, then you can just log in using one of the well-known default passwords. A proof of concept exploit using this little handshake scheme has been published to a GitHub. Census, which is one of these research efforts to scan the internet for certain service already heavily scanning this particular port. Don't see a ton of scanning from other sources right now. Well, and that's it for today. So thanks again for listening and talk to you again tomorrow. Bye.